Tonight, we've got a couple of tales from some people with odd jobs. I don't mean fixing the lawnmower or repairing the sink. I mean the kind of jobs that bump up against the otherworldly. The kind that makes you sign a waiver. The kind where, any night, you might clock in, but never clock back out. This next story is called... I Was Hired to Notice Things Out of Place, written by D.D. D. Wickman. As a kid, I was scared of pretty much everything. At night, I'd see faces moving in the wallpaper. I'd see branches slither like snakes. Piles of clothes turn to slumped bodies. Lamps look like heads. And the front of cars grinned at me with sinister intent. I could also hear, hear them. A creaking door would sound like a groan. The wind would scream, and floorboards would breathe heavy sighs. To me, there were ghouls, ghosts, and monsters around every corner. Needless to say, I was a nervous kid. Turns out, it wasn't just an active imagination. I have a condition. It basically boils down to chronic overactive pareidolia. You know that thing where you can see faces in cars or shapes of people in trees? That's pareidolia. It is a sort of defense mechanism that humans have evolved to notice camouflaged creatures, like jaguars and snakes, and to discern the sounds of encroaching predators. But to me, it's about 16 times more noticeable than what's normal for the average person. I see things everywhere all the time. Of course, there were treatments. By age 12, I had tried six different regimens over a total of four years, and the side effects were brutal. Some would make me irritable, while others would make me hyper-focused. One type of medication just straight up put me to sleep. By age 18, I thought I'd never get a job. I was barely dragging myself through school, and there was no way I'd make it through college. I was on a course of drugs that barely kept me together, but they gave me these awful tics. I'd drop things, I'd wake up in the middle of the night, my leg would shoot out and trip me. I was a mess. My mom had to cover the stairs and handrail in grip tape. A few years ago, I had a standing meeting with the county employment services every Thursday. I hated it. On a particularly bad day, my mom had to drive me there. The meds were kicking my ass. She dropped me off at the end of the street, and just in that short walk to the office, I almost tripped into a brick wall. I was so flustered, I knocked over a trash can. But for the first time in a couple of years, I had an interview with a potential employer. I didn't think much of her, she was just some old woman in a warm coat. She introduced herself as Teresa and told me that she'd heard a lot about me. She offered me a trial and a hefty one-time payment. I didn't get a clear idea about what I was supposed to do, but she told me that secrecy was part of it. The only demand she had was that I stop taking my meds. Still feeling the trash smell on my pants, I took Teresa up on her offer. On my first day of work, I had no idea what to expect. I'd been off my meds for a week, and I'd barely slept. It was hard to wrap my head around the world as I'd seen it as a kid. I'd see faces in the walls, in the shadows, in the leaves, in patterns, pretty much everywhere. I'd hear voices and screams in every breaking car, in crinkling paper and creaking floors. It was hard staying focused, and I was so jumpy I could barely move without flinching. Teresa picked me up in a gray sedan. She was wearing a headset and kept looking over at the GPS. I noticed her leg was twitching and that she kept biting her lip. She barely looked at me that whole ride. We finally arrived at a small yard, about a 40-minute drive off the highway. There were two large trailers and a single-story run-down prefab house from the 60s, 
One of those things with cheap wood panels and matching broken windows. There were eight other vehicles in the yard. Four sedans, two vans, a jeep, and a bus. They'd set up warning tape, a command tent with laptops and an antenna, spotlights, and half a dozen crates covered with blue tarps. There were armed men with assault rifles, security personnel with handcuffs, and a couple of medics standing by with first aid kits and stretchers. I was swarmed as soon as I stepped out of the car. They fitted me with a headset, protective gloves, a heart monitor, and tagged me with a plastic ribbon around my left wrist. All the while, Teresa was just looking around, a bead of sweat stinging her eye. What are we looking at? She asked. Three? Four? Just one, I heard in the headset. We got it early. You got the spot? On sight, she responded. Any blues? No blues. We're clear. Teresa finally turned to me. She faced me, put her hands on my shoulders, and talked slowly. This seems like a lot, she said. All I want you to do is to go inside, carefully, and tell me what you see. Why? I asked. What's in there? I don't know, she sighed. None of us knows, but we think you can see it. Is it dangerous? She shook her head. We don't know. We're trying to get to know them. There was a flurry of instructions. I had to sign a waiver. They took pictures of me from six different angles and took several blood samples. They took a swab from my tongue, checked my eyes, and fitted me with a pair of safety goggles. Teresa took them from me just seconds later. Nothing around the eyes, she said. You need to see clearly. They asked me to approach the door while they were running some kind of diagnostic. Weapon checks, system checks, ready checks. It felt like we were launching a rocket. I could feel my legs shaking. I'm with you all the way, Teresa said over the headset. You can leave at any time. Just tell me what you see, and I really mean what you see. A countdown began. At zero, the spotlights turned on, and the entire yard turned into a soundless ghost town. Everyone held their breaths. It was my turn. I stepped inside. A simple one-story house. Three rooms, a bathroom, a kitchen. Someone had clearly lived there until recently. There were still clothes flung over a chair in the living room. The power was off, but the pale spotlights coming in through the windows made it feel like I was walking through a hospital waiting room. My heart was pounding out of my chest. I didn't know what to expect, but this payday could be the boost I needed to get my own place. A paycheck with four zeros for a single day of work. But standing there, looking into the sterile living room, I was having doubts. What do you see? asked Teresa. Notice anything? No, just, just furniture. A couch, an old TV, a fancy carpet. Nothing out of the ordinary. I just walked around, saying out loud what I was seeing. As the minutes passed, Teresa was getting impatient. These are just things, she said. I need you to tell me what you really see. I entered the bathroom and immediately felt this awful feeling in the pit of my stomach. A noise tickled my ear. Looking in the bathroom mirror, I could see something moving behind me. In a heartbeat, I caught a glimpse of a pair of blue eyes. I turned around, screaming, Something! Something moved! I flung myself backwards, closing the bathroom door with the tip of my fingers. I stumbled, tearing down the shower curtains and crushing a cockroach. 
Laying there with my feet in the air, I tried to remember to breathe. Rarely have I been so scared that I had to remind myself to breathe. My fingers tingled with adrenaline. Tell me what you saw, Teresa yelled. What's in there? Blue eyes! It had blue eyes! Did you see where it went? I didn't. To the best of my knowledge, it was still outside the door. Look again, she continued. Look again, then get out. She had to coax me out of the bathtub. She encouraged me, spurred me on, and reminded me that I had to leave that room one way or the other. It probably took them fifteen minutes to get me out of the tub, and when they did, I could barely feel my feet. When I finally opened the bathroom door, I couldn't see anyone. The hallway was empty. I carefully stepped out, looking around. Nothing. Standing in the middle of the living room, I felt like an idiot. This was exactly what I was taking my medication for. Paranoia and sudden bouts of fear. It dawned on me that maybe I was influenced by all the people outside and their preparations. I was walking in here expecting to see something. They'd worked me up, so of course I was seeing things. But then again, there was an odd painting on the wall that I hadn't paid attention to earlier. It was the strangest thing. It was a sort of thrift store painting, showing two women walking across a bridge on a hot summer's day. It was sort of generic, but I'd been hyper-vigilant when I first stepped in. You know that feeling when you say a word over and over so many times that it starts sounding like a noise? That's the feeling that fell over my eyes. The picture started to blur and disappear, turning into swirling colors. And there, in that blur, I saw those blue eyes. There were small blue spots in the water, on the sides of the bridge in the painting. That's what I'd seen. And there, I'd seen a face. Something blending into my sight, disappearing. And for a second... I knew for certain that I hadn't seen this painting when I first stepped inside. And now it knew that I could see it. I felt it. I slowly started to back out. There's something in the painting, I whispered. In the living room? You sure? Teresa asked. Absolutely sure? Absolutely. Get out. I rounded the corner and heard the floorboards creak. I could no longer see the painting, and I could sense something move. Backing out of the front door and into the cool autumn air, I could feel hands on my shoulder. Armed men pulled me back, and paramedics started to check my eyes with flashlights. They asked me all sorts of personal questions— like my name, my mother's maiden name, and the name of the president. I was told to lay down, as I heard a team breach the house with stun guns, cattle prods, nets, and a crate. Laying there and feeling the pressure subside, I just cried and laughed. I didn't even notice Teresa sitting down next to me. I was given a cold drink and a pill, and I took it without question. You did good, she said. You're done. You're done. What was that? What's in there? Something only a special mind can see. That was my first time working with Teresa. Over the coming years, I would be called in about once or twice a month, and the pay I got from those few days were enough to get me out of my parents' house. Teresa would check in with me weekly, and I had to submit to regular checkups, but more often than not, I was completely off the leash. I started to learn a bit more about the company I was working for and what they were doing. I started getting payments from Hatchet Biotechnica, a subsidiary of Hatchet Pharmaceuticals. 
My official title was Contractor, a title that was repeated like a name. Teresa started going into greater details on what to look for and how to act. But that first mission was a sort of test to prove myself. I had no idea what I was actually proving, but it felt like my tendency to discern patterns and seeing dangers helped me along. I learned a bit more about their procedures. For example, they were adamant about checking for blues. This meant surveying the nearby area to look for some kind of infection, usually taking the form of miscolored flowers, most often blue, but not always, sometimes tulips, most often sunflowers. Once, they just found a bunch of teeth sticking out of the wall. Whenever they checked for blues, this is what they would look for, something overtly strange and unnatural. When something like this was found, the whole mission would be called off, and they would use controlled explosives to just take out the entire area. In more populated areas, they'd set up tents and use flamethrowers. I remember once, the week before Christmas, when six men with flamethrowers were called in to burn down a greenhouse. I'll never forget the way the flames reflected off their visors. To them, it all just looked like flames. But I saw something else. I saw bodies writhing in the flames. I heard screams in the shattered glass, and in the charred remains of melted plastic, I'd see pained faces glaring at me with hateful black eyes. Up until a few months ago, I'd worked a total of 33 cases over two and a half years. Every case, I'd step into a location and look for one to three things hiding in plain sight. Up until that point, I still had no idea what they actually were. Sometimes I'd catch a glimpse of something running past me or see a pair of blue eyes looking at me from across the room. Every time, I just reported it and left. A chair, a fridge, a suspicious window. Hell, once it was a music box. This time... We were just coming up to a house. It was a rainy autumn evening, and the area was already set up when we got there. I saw a for sale sign, knocked over by one of the jeeps who'd taken a wide turn. I got suited up. Blood samples, plastic wrap, all that jazz. It was set up to be just another job. Although I was still nervous, I was getting better. No blues? asked Teresa. None, said one of the armed men. We're looking at a single tango. You sure? Teresa squinted. First report said six. Secondary reading says one. We might have runners. Notify the Galapagos, she sighed. Put him on the hunt. She turned to me with a smile, tapping me on the shoulder. In and out. You got this. I got this, I repeated. Yeah. Standard routine. Countdown, spotlights, game on. It felt like stepping onto a stage. As I walked through the door and saw my shadow stretch out across the floor, I felt like a hunter. That I was the one to fear, and that whatever stayed in this house tried to hide for good reason. The floor is crooked. I noted. Strange place. You sure? Yeah, I nodded. Definitely. I steadied myself and started checking the rooms one by one. I waited for that feeling to emerge, my eyes seeing through the obvious and seeing the picture beneath the picture, the blue eyes emerging from nothing and the patterns of shadowy figures growing clearer. Just relaxing and expecting that feeling to wash over me was enough to put me at ease, but I could still feel a primal part of me tickling my nerves, expecting me to panic. But nothing happened. I checked the kitchen, the living room, the bedroom. There was nothing. Just a strangely crooked floor 
empty rooms and the echo of my own footsteps, an empty guest bedroom with a single window. Through it, I imagine scowling faces in the trees outside. Twenty minutes passed, and I got nothing. I reported to Teresa, and she assured me we were still getting readings from inside the house. Something was still in there with me, but I hadn't seen anything. I went through cycles of denial, fear, and anger, over and over. What was I missing? Finally, I just sat down in the middle of the living room floor. I scratched my eyes, sighed, and tried to relax. Teresa, I'm... I'm not feeling it. Are you sure? There was no response. Teresa? Yeah? She responded absent-mindedly. Yeah, no, I... We're good. Hold on for a minute. We're good? I asked. What do you mean, we're good? Again, no response. I stomped around for another ten minutes before I went up to a window facing the front yard. It was hard to see through the glare of the spotlight. Teresa? I'm coming out. The place is empty. As soon as I opened the front door, I saw two dozen faces fixed on me. Maybe they were surprised to see me, but I got the sense that there was something else. I could tell something was off. They all looked at me with strange expressions, some neutral, some smiling ear to ear, one of the paramedics just stared at me with slack-jawed terror. It was as if they didn't know what to feel or how to express it. A hole sunk through my stomach. I got that hollow feeling as my eyes glazed over, like I was staring at something false, something hiding a pattern. This was the sense I'd been looking for inside, and now I was feeling it. In the far back, I saw Teresa. She stepped out from behind a jeep, smiling ear to ear. Behind the shape of her face, her eyes emerged, glowing with a cold blue. One by one, their eyes flared up in a blue glow, and there, in a moment, my paranoid sight registered human-like shapes in the grass around them, Headless, mauled bodies. Imposters, lookalikes, mimics, nightmare beings, having tricked us into a trap. One by one, smiles started creeping across their faces. Rows of impossibly sharp teeth, hiding long tongues. Their fingers growing longer, their necks elongating. They were losing their disguises and facing me head on, unafraid. Nothing was said out loud, not a word, but to me it was as if the wind itself was screaming for me to run. I slammed the door behind me and ran. Faces were coming out of the walls, door handles turning into hands, grasping at my clothes my distorted face reflecting in windows and mirrors with jawless grins. I couldn't blink. Every heartbeat, a new horror forced my eyes open. There were more doors than I remembered. There were more windows than there should be. The kitchen suddenly had a skylight, and there were four fridges. Countless paintings had appeared in the master bedroom, depicting cruel and blood-drenched horrors. They were already here, trying to surround me, and my mind was racing to remember what was real and what wasn't. Rushing to the back of the guest bedroom, I remembered there being only one window. Now, there were two. I had to roll the dice, take a guess, do something. As I grabbed the window frame, I imagined teeth slamming into my hands, Tongues licking across my palms, wide smiles sating their hunger. But this time, it was just my imagination. I burst through the window and took off running into the woods. 
through the night, I just kept going. My chest hurt from holding the screams in. Without my medication, everything in the dark looked like something reaching for me, trying to eat me, trying to grab me. Creaking branches sounded like laughter, and howling winds were screams. I must have run for hours when my foot got caught between two rocks. As I tumbled to the ground, twisting my ankle, I saw them descend on me. I felt their fingers scratching me. I writhed on the ground, screaming for them to just let me go, to just please, please let me go. But after a few seconds, I realized I'd just scratch myself on the underbrush. There was no one there. I was safe. I broke down crying, trying to ignore the twisted face reflecting off the full moon above. Eventually, I made my way home. There were no messages waiting for me. All my work numbers had been taken offline. All ways to contact them were just gone, and there was no info on the firm that hired me. Hatchet Biotechnica exists only on paper. There's no location, no contact info, and no names attached. It's all a front. I haven't heard from Teresa since. I think that whoever I've been working for has just assumed I'm dead. That's why I decided to share this anonymously. Those who know who I am can reach out to me. And for those who don't, I just have a word of warning. Be observant. Trust your intuition. It might save your life. Trust your intuition. That's good advice for someone with a job like that. Maybe not every hulking shape in your closet or menacing monster in the corner is a false alarm. After all, it only takes one to do the trick. Our next story brings us to the best place to start when you're running from your fears. The gas station. Except tonight, the fear has caught up, and it wants to get in. This story is called, People Go Missing on the Night Shift, She Tried to Save Me, written by D.D. D. Wickman. It was my first night shift. Working extra at a gas station is pretty far from every boy's dream, but it pays the bills. I was hell-bent on not having another opportunity slip out of my hands because of money. One small investment and a move to Minneapolis, and I would have had a six-figure salary. But I just couldn't find the funds. So there I was, stocking the shelves at a gas station. Money's money, and there's plenty of future to go around, I figured. I'd worked a few day shifts before, so I knew the place well enough. However, I'd never been left alone for the night shift before. This was the first time I'd be completely unsupervised. Jada, my supervisor, was about to take off for the night. She kept repeating the same instructions over and over. Then again, this place had huge turnover. Maybe she honestly forgot I wasn't that new. No phones, she urged. If you got a slow night, make yourself useful. Nod and smile. I decided to get the worst tasks out of the way early. Cleaning the bathroom, restocking the freezers, taking out the trash, checking the receipt rolls, watering the plants. It took me about an hour. It wasn't even midnight yet, and I was pretty much done for the night. I considered mopping the floor, but I figured I could save that for later. I'd been useful enough. I was on my fourth game of team fight tactics when I realized I'd forgotten my name tag. No big deal, really, but figured I might as well fetch it. The manager's office was usually locked, but tonight I had the keys to open it. I opened the door and started going through the drawers. Didn't take long to find the name tags. There was an entire box of them. 
At first, I thought they were all blanks. But as I started going through them, I realized they were all previous employees. Sure, this place had high turnover, but this? We're talking about a hundred people. Easy. This was ridiculous. I admit, this is where I started asking myself some questions. During the day shift, there was always someone new, someone being trained or interviewed. I'd only been there for about a week, and I was already feeling like a veteran. The only people who seemed to be regulars were the managers, Jada, Kennedy, and Alicia. They seemed decent enough, so why were so many people quitting? As I got back behind the register, I realized there was a customer outside. Literally, just outside the door. I waved at them. There was something off. They were just standing there, but they were so close that the automated doors should have opened, and yet the doors remained closed. It was a man, late thirties, scraggly beard, rough red shirt, bit of a chunky look with sunken bloodshot eyes and a natural frown. He just stared at me. I waved at him again, but I got no response. Can I help you? I called out. Nothing. Not a blink. I pulled out a chair and sat down. The man stayed outside, looking in. I tried not to think about it, but it was bothering me. I couldn't see his car anywhere on the cameras, and he didn't seem to want anything. I couldn't tell if he was on drugs or just being weird. I gave him a few minutes, but he just stood there. Finally, I got up from my chair. Sir, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. He didn't seem to listen. He was a bit shorter than me, but he had a good fifty pounds on me. He'd be trouble in a brawl. I don't want to call the police, I said. Can I help you, sir? I pulled out my phone. I dialed the number and held it up for him to see, but still nothing. Then my phone rang. Unknown caller. It was just past midnight. Without letting the unnerving man out of my sight, I took the call. Yeah? I answered. Please don't hang up, a voice on the other end said. You're in danger, and I can help. I was getting nervous. I wandered back and forth, watching those bloodshot eyes follow me. Who is this? I asked. I'm Angie, the voice responded. I used to work there. Same shift, same managers. I wanted to warn you. I'd seen an Angie tag in the box earlier. Maybe even several. She sounded young and nervous as all hell. In a few hours, something terrible's gonna happen, she continued. And if you're not out by then, you might as well be dead. What are you talking about? Look outside. I'd been looking outside this entire time, but I'd been entirely focused on this one man outside the front door. From across the road, I could see more people, about a dozen, lumbering out of the woods. I need you to leave, she said. Just walk out. Nothing will happen if you just walk away. Nothing will come for you. Who, who are these people? What's going to happen? I, I, I don't know what... Look, she interrupted. It's perfectly simple. Just walk out the door. Something in me screamed for me not to do it that I shouldn't step outside and walk past these people. They felt malicious, and I couldn't put my finger on why. Still, I stepped up to the door. Leaving seemed like the obvious choice. Strangely, it didn't open. It won't open, I said. Hold on. They, they want to keep you in there. They don't want you to leave. They want you to stay and die. Die? 
I asked. What do you mean? I stopped my pacing. Something was wrong. Was I locked in? Tell me exactly what's about to happen, I demanded. Something is in there with you, Angie sighed. It could be five minutes, it could be a few hours, but that thing in there is coming for you. And what thing are we talking about? The man with the bloodshot eyes had two people joining him. A young man with a grotesque overbite and a young woman who could easily be mistaken for a child. All of them stared at me with the same broken eyes and rough clothes. They stopped inches short of the front door. It doesn't have a name, Angie said. But it'll leave you empty. It'll leave you like the people out front. But if I leave, I'll be okay? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. Hold on, I'll check the back. I hurried out back to the employee entrance. I pressed down the cold handle, and the door swung open. Outside were another group of four people. Two young men, an older woman, and a girl no more than sixteen years old. They all stared at me. I couldn't tell if they were drawn to me or the store. I stopped short of stepping through the door. Why do, do they come here? I asked Angie. They serve their master. They want the spoils. What spoils? What? I thought about it. She was talking about me. Right, I said, nodding to myself. I see. Are you at the back door? Are you there yet? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Just walk out, she whispered. It's not too late. I was just about to walk out when a thought hit me. Why would they lock the front door, but not the back? That didn't make any sense. If the purpose was to keep me here, they could easily barricade the back as well. Something didn't add up. The door is open, I said. Great! You can still make it! Why wouldn't they lock the back door, Angie? She hesitated, and there was a brief pause. If they're locking me in here to hurt me, why wouldn't they lock the back door? I repeated. I don't know, she said, but you have to trust me. They gave me the keys, Angie. They go everywhere. I can lock and unlock this door a hundred times. What's going on? They... they don't usually do that. I closed the door and stepped back. Four less pairs of eyes staring at me. Look, said Angie. I was the last person to leave. They fucked up. I found a spare key and got out before it was too late. Maybe, maybe they figured I'd warn you. Maybe they're trying to trick you. Sure, yeah, I chuckled. Convenient. I'm trying to help you, she cried out. Those things out there are to discourage you from going outside. They're harmless, but they're there to scare you. Can't you see it's all just a way for them to keep you in there? I got one person screaming at me to go outside, and no one telling me to stay. No locked doors, just plenty of fucking creeps staring at me. What am I supposed to believe? Fine. You want more proof? Call the police. Hang up and call them. I ended the call. There were eight people out front by now, all gathering outside the front door. I couldn't tell if they were trying to get in or if they were waiting for me to step out. I called the emergency services, only to be met with silence. Not even a dial tone. Just a blank nothing. I tried a few more numbers. My mom, my friends. I tried going online, but all I got was cached copies of sites I'd been to before. My background picture had changed to a blank screen. 
but there was something else. Something had started to smell. The freshly stocked frozen goods had suddenly gone bad, and a stench was oozing out of the freezers. Our flowers by the counter had withered and died, all except the sunflowers, which had turned a sickly blue. I wasn't getting through to anyone. Being inside was awful. The single-serving frozen meals were making me gag. I figured I'd go for the landline. As I got in the manager's office, I got another call on my phone. Unknown caller. Looking back and forth between my phone and the landline, I weighed my options. I chose Angie. How are you getting through? I asked her. How do you know my number? I still got the email password. I just checked your application. But how come your number works? Everything else is down. I'm calling from a private network, she said. They don't know there's a way in. They? I asked. I thought it was just one thing. No, they're working together. People don't just go missing without someone noticing. So there's like a, an intelligence behind it? A conspiracy? Yeah, people come and go in these places all the time. Are they paying you under the table? Uh, they figured uh, it was sort of a trial and no paperwork, no missing people, no records, just a box of name tags. It made sense, in a way, but I needed more. I needed proof. There had to be something. Why didn't you call me earlier? I asked. You could have called me as soon as I got the job, or, or as soon as my shift started. I had to make sure Jada wasn't around, she said. She would have tried to trick you. I'm not sure you're not trying to trick me. Why would I spend my time calling you from across the country just to have you fail? She screamed. If I was part of this, I would have just let you sit there with your goddamn team fight tactics and die. She went quiet. So did I. I counted my breaths as I looked outside. There were more of them now. How did you know what I was playing? I asked. She didn't respond. The silence hung in the air. I'm asking you, how did you know what I was playing? She was just as quiet as the man with the bloodshot eyes, still waiting for me outside the door. You're watching. You knew I was alone. You knew I was getting antsy about the guy showing up outside. Yeah, she sighed. You tried to get me out as soon as he showed up. You tried to trick me before there were too many of them to scare me off. That's... that's not... She sighed. I could hear heavy breathing. As I paced back and forth, I was getting ready to hang up. This was a trick. She was the one tricking me, clearly. Trying to get me outside to... join those things. I know... This looks bad, she said. I know. I'm sorry. I'm honestly just trying to help you. This time, I was the one keeping quiet. I walked up to the door, studying the people outside. Blank stares, following my every move. I felt like a snake charmer, like they could snap out of it and tear me apart in the blink of an eye. As I said, I... I have the passwords for everything. I'm the only one who knows them. I just wanted to give you the best shot at getting out of there. I hoped they wouldn't come tonight, but as soon as they did, I just... I had to do something. You're not being honest with me. I'm not lying. I'm just... just having a hard time explaining it. There's a lot of shit about this that all sounds completely insane. I don't want to throw you off the deep end. Give it to me straight, I demanded. Tell me what the fuck is coming for me. 
it's not a thing. Like, not real. It's there, but it's just... I don't know how to explain it. It just steps through. Steps through what? The world, the air, a, a ripple in time, or or something. It just steps in, and it's there. And then? Then it shoves some kind of mouth spike into your head and gargles up something inside. A mouth spike? What the hell are you... Yes, a spike. And no, I mean, it goes into your mouth. It doesn't have a mouth of its own. It just goes into you and gone. Game over. I didn't know what to think. My mind was a jumbled mess, and I felt my pulse rising and falling. There were over 18 people outside in various states of disarray, all of them just staring at me. If I just stepped outside, I'd know for sure. What does it look like? Does it... The lights flickered. There was a loud hum, a buzz, and then an electric failure. One of the fluorescent lights burned out, while the others just slowly dimmed to nothing. This was real. It was make or break by this point. Something was happening. The lights went out, I whispered. Is this... Now! Angie screamed. Get out! Now! I ran. I tripped and tumbled my way into the back room in complete darkness. I almost twisted my ankle as I bumped into the lunch table. I could barely hear my thoughts, and I had to remind myself to breathe. The roof of my mouth ached, as if anticipating a piercing pain. I could feel my head filling with blood and adrenaline as my dry eyes refused to blink. As I put my hand on the back door, I made the mistake of pulling instead of pushing. It took me three tries before a thought hit me. I couldn't see the sign on the door because of the darkness. In fact, I couldn't see anything. Nothing. Uh, Angie, I wheezed, putting my phone to my ear. You there? Hurry, she screamed. You can make it. How did you see it? The thing was huge. It just... No. How did you... You see it in, in complete darkness. You said the lights went out. It was right there. I can't even see the sign on the back door. How the hell did you see a spike? Look, I... And to add to that... How the hell do you know what it does with that spike? You've never seen the thing kill. You said you were the last one to work this shift, and the thing sure as hell didn't kill you. You're missing the point. I... It doesn't add up, Angie. None of this adds up. You couldn't have seen it, and there's no way for you to know how it kills. I stood there in the dark. I heard Angie panting on the other side, matching my breathing. You're lying to me, Angie. You're not trying to save me. She stopped breathing. For about a minute, it was just quiet. The call ended. A wave washed over me. I was either dead or saved. There was no in-between. I was moments from finding out. Every little sound shook me. A breeze just outside, a crackling wire, ventilation struggling to turn back on. I hadn't even noticed my hand was on the door handle. You lied to me, I said out loud. You, you did. I caught you. There was a sound coming from the other side of the door, a shuffling of feet. Yeah said Angie from the other side of the door. I must have stood there for an hour until the power came back on. The people outside were gone. Angie was gone. My phone worked just fine, so I called everyone and just cried for help. 
The police found me locked in the bathroom in a full panic, and I barely even remember being escorted out. Cameras had picked up a mob gathering outside, but that was pretty much it. They couldn't be identified from the back of their heads. Jada and the other managers were called in, and they seemed genuinely surprised. I've since looked it up. A hundred people starting and quitting their job in a place like that isn't uncommon. People come and go all the time. The managers honestly didn't know why people disappeared, it seems. Maybe this is just how things work? Or maybe... There's more than one Angie out there, preying on short-term workers. And the front door? There was no conspiracy there. The thing just jams sometimes, some kind of trouble with the wiring. If I'd messed with it just a bit more, the thing could have kicked wide open. That broken door was the only thing that saved me from joining them that night. I would have walked right out as soon as Angie asked me to. I worked there for another four months, but just day shifts and weekends. The night shifts seemed to go off without a hitch, though. Maybe Angie and her friends moved on from an easy meal. I've saved up enough for my move to Minneapolis, but I'd never forgive myself if I didn't put this into writing. Looking back at it, it feels surreal. There are things out there, things that want us to join them. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's stories, both brought to us by D.D. D. Wickman. You can find links to his stories and social media below, as well as a link to donate. Please support our authors however you can. And before you go, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more scary stories. And... Don't fall asleep.